gentlemen, uh, this is our community's house. We are all guests here in it to, to serve our community. Uh, my name is Mike Little, Mayor for the District of North Vancouver, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here to the special meeting of Council for uh, Monday, February 13th at 5 o'clock. Uh, at this point, I'd like to ask Councillor Ma to uh, read our land acknowledgement. Uh, th thank you, um, Mayor Little. It's my honour to present the land acknowledgement. Uh, we respectfully acknowledge the original peoples of these lands and waters, specifically the Slavotooth, Squamish, and Musqueam, on whose unceded ancestral lands the District of North Vancouver is located. We value the opportunity to learn, share, and serve our community on these unceded lands. Thank you, Councillor. All right. Uh, just before we get going, I was just going to uh, start off by mentioning this is called a special meeting of council. And the only reason why it's a special meeting of council is that it wasn't on the original uh, calendar uh, that we uh, approved back at the end of November, December, beginning of January for the entire year's uh, meeting schedule. And so when we add a meeting, it becomes called a special meeting. Now we put all of the regular trappings of a regular meeting of council in, there will still be a public input period. Um, and uh, we do have uh, uh, some uh, items to discuss, uh, but it was added because um, uh, in consultation with staff, they wanted the, um, an extra night for the financial deliberations um, and uh, with uh, the holidays around with uh, um, family day and, uh, and Easter and such, it was getting hard to add additional Monday meetings. And so we've decided to do a five o'clock special meeting of council for the purpose of receiving the, uh, the budget. Uh, and then as things progressed, there were other items that came up through staff that we wanted to, uh, uh, to put on the agenda as well. So we do have a five, five item agenda and we do have a cutoff of seven o'clock tonight. So council, if we're not able to get everything done by seven o'clock, then we'll move over to the workshop at that point. And once we finish the workshop, then we would resume the regular meeting of council. And so ideally uh, we'd like to finish everything on this agenda um, by seven o'clock or, um, you know, we could table items to a future council meeting or we'd be coming back at the tail end of the meeting. So uh, we will need to be a little um, um, careful about our time management tonight. Um, council, we have an agenda that's been circulated. Are there any errors or omissions from the agenda as presented? Hearing none, will someone please move adoption of the agenda? I've got moved by Councilor Mary, second by Councilor Back, call a question on the matter. All those in favor? Contrary minded, motion carries. Council, we have two sets of meeting minutes that have been circulated with the package. Are there any errors or omissions in those meeting minutes? Hearing none, moved by Councillor Murray, second by Councillor Back. We'll call the question on the favor. All those in favor, contrary minded, motion carries. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Council, moving on, um, we have several release of closed meeting decisions that have been articulated in the package. Most of those items are pertaining to uh, uh, people that we have uh, um, uh, that are volunteering on committees in the community. And so this is the affirmation of their um, participation as volunteers. If you want to take a look at that, that's now available for public. And then uh, uh, we do also have uh, an opportunity for members of the public to speak. And so uh, we reserve a period of up to 30 minutes at the front end of uh, regular meetings of council to hear uh, comments of concern in the community. And, um, and uh, everybody gets an opportunity for about three minutes time to speak. We do have a speakers list that has been established by people who signed up ahead of time. And I have uh, six speakers on agenda reports, two speakers on non-agenda reports. Uh, we should be able to get through all of those um, as we go through. So the first speaker I'm going to call on, oh, and one other thing I need to say. So this meeting is being held in a hybrid fashion. That means that members of the public staff and council can participate in the meeting either virtually or in person. Uh, all members of council happen to be here in person here today, but we do have some speakers who have signed up to speak that will be joining us virtually through the in-house system. Uh, the first speaker we have is Paul Perkins, followed by Judith Brooke. Uh, so I'll call on Paul Perkins to come down and, and sit at the desk here. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor and Council, for the opportunity to speak to the permit for 2672 Panorama. Uh, my name is obviously Paul Perkins. My presentation today has two parts. Uh, first is a statement my wife Sharon has written and asked me to read, and then my comments, which we hope provide Council with an option to consider going forward. 
First, I'd like to thank uh, Taylor Jenks for her patience in working with us and address our concerns. Taylor's package to yourselves, which I'm assuming you have all read, uh, is very complete. We are obviously the neighbors to the West. Taylor has worked with us to try and find solutions to our major concerns, which have been the same since the initial permit was granted for this property back in 2012. So this has been a saga, as Leslie will attest to as the owner. Um, the shared trees and our privacy, particularly from car lights and noise, uh, given the district's driveway entrances, have been the main issues that have been worked um, by uh, Taylor, and she has had great cooperation from the team. And I'm going to read Sharon's statement. Uh, we have been residents of Deep Cove for 70 years and have lived on Panorama for 53 years, the last 50 of them at our current address. We bought the property because of the landscape, water view, and four lovely large evergreen trees. These trees are now probably 75 to 100 feet tall and they keep us healthy. Damage was done to one of these large trees by a previous development next door. Protection of the tree was ignored and caused great deal of stress to us and the tree. Revisiting this again, the two trees on the border uh, and officially monitored by the arborist. We are prepared to pay for our own arborist to work in cooperation as well. The parking and turnaround being proposed to come right to our fence uh, with no three foot allowance has had some concern for us, but we uh, thought we can now live with that. What we would like also to point out was the extreme damage that was done to our front yard, which was completely flooded as a result of the workers next door digging below the stream level on the first attempt at construction. Next door, this very unpleasant experience made us very cautious of accepting the developer's claims of responsibility. And it's why we feel we need the district's support to protect our trees and our property. And now switching to my statements, um, and there's some repetition with what Sharon said, but hopefully this will just serve to emphasize what we feel is important. We appreciate the difficulty of building on this site, which has only been compounded as a result of the problems that arose in 2014. During the construction phase under the previous building permit, it was at this time that we came to understand how the district process works and came to feel that it truly failed both us and the property owners. Unfortunately, this construction phase was a disaster. With the contractor building an unapproved wall, rerouting a portion of the creek, causing a major washout from the lot, both into the bay and across our property. What your package does not say is that the district staff, which had supported the original permit, blamed everyone but themselves, the developer, engineers, architects, the weather, and took no blame for, for themselves, failing to recognize that an excavation below the creek's natural elevation was a recipe for disaster. I tell you all of this only to give you a flavor of what we have gone through. This incident cost us personally approximately $30,000 for an environmental lawyer, consultants, and untold hours to put our yard back. This is all history, but I hope explains why we are so engaged in the process. The district approach is the same today. You manage a process to get a development permit, but ultimately the process puts all the responsibility for the quality of design and performance back on the developer and their professional team. To address the potential for shortfall on the part of developers, the district imposes performance bonds. In the case of protecting our trees in this permit, that deposit is $10,000. The reality is that during the last development period, the contractors paid little to no attention to the designated tree protection zones. In this application, it is comforting for us to see that Michelle, the arborist for Radix, is required to be on site during significant construction. Mr. Perkins, I'm gonna pause you there for a sec. So we're way over your time already. I'm, I'm within half a page of being there, Mayor. If I can wrap up your... very quickly, I'd really appreciate that because we're gonna be under time crunch okay. today as it is, yeah. <laughs> um, you can't put a price on, uh, on an 80 year old tree. The fact is, that is that $10,000 is not enough to get developers priority. When you're dealing with an estimated building cost of 900 to a million, 900,000 to a million dollars, a finished market value of probably three to 3.5 million, to think that they can pay their way out of ignoring the tree protection requirements is not appropriate. In our opinion, we need to work together going forward on this. And we, there should be some methodology for ourselves as the key neighbors sharing the trees to work with 
the host team on, okay. on this work. So okay. if, uh, you're absolutely welcome to send any other comments you, you may want to, but we're at five minutes now of a three yeah, minute sorry. presentation. We're, we're just way over. So thank you very much, Mr. Perkins. If you want to leave your written, we can, in the sure. black tray, we'll, we'll scan it and send it around. Okay, great. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll see if we have someone available. We're going to continue with this, though. We don't. We want to make sure that we're giving all of the other speakers the attention they need, right, um, as well. So um, uh, I understand that Judith Brooke has not joined the virtual side of the meeting or has indicated that she's withdrawing her name. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. Okay. Can we'll just double check uh, to see if Judith Brooke is on the call. I don't see Judith Brooke on the call. Okay. Uh, the next speaker is Aaron Noor, followed by Renee Gorley. Aaron Noor, uh, welcome. You have three minutes to address the council. Yeah. <clears throat> Good evening, members of council. Uh, my name is Aaron Noor. Uh, my mother and father in law uh, purchased the property in an existing home at 2672 Panorama Drive 43 years ago in 1980 with the intent of one day moving here to retire along the water at Deep Cove. They decided to rebuild the original two bedroom house a little over 10 years ago now, and the design was approved for both development and building permit with variances in 2014. Excavation was nearly complete in the fall of that year when flooding along Panorama Drive caused the creek running through the site to collapse. The subsequent challenges have been well documented by staff and uh, Michael will speak to this, the architect in his summary as well. Um, throughout this time, we've worked closely with staff to modify the design and address any concerns that have come up uh, from staff and stakeholders on the project um, and changes in code and regulations. After eight years of difficulty, the lot still sits empty today, which we feel is a benefit to no one in the neighborhood or the community. Um, we're very much looking forward to moving ahead with rebuilding the site and restoring, restoring its place in the community. And I would ask council to consider our family's hardship uh, in nearly a decade of delays and hundreds of thousands of dollars in expenses um, in considering the approval of the staff supported development permit today. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron Noor. Uh, next speaker I have is Renee Gorley, followed by Keith Reynolds. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council, for hearing me today. Uh, I've spoken to many of you before uh, because indeed I've been pursuing a park in the Delbrook lands for four. I think councils so far, uh, and uh, speaking of, uh, what was the great word you had? Um, oh, it was a good word. Uh, the, the long story bit that of the, the park is, uh, is back. So imagine after seeing that uh, the park was being planned and was supposed to come before council last spring, the plans were, I don't think they ever did last year, uh, but, um, prior to that, we had believed that the build would be going on this year, and then imagine seeing it on the litany of projects that were potentially on the chopping block with this budget. Uh, the whole team was uh, very, uh, well, disappointed doesn't quite capture it. And I'm delighted to hear that it may now be back in the budget. I just want to ensure that it stays there uh, because uh, some members of our team have been pursuing a park in Bellbrook for longer than any of us has been alive. And uh, I would really like to see the park constructed before, uh, while we still can. Uh, so this is my encouragement to uh, ensure that this budget goes ahead with the park included and, uh, and that your legacy is uh, a park and many other great additions to our community as opposed to a to-do list. Thank you. Thank you, Renee Gorley. Next, I have Keith Reynolds, followed by Michael Wortman. Uh, Mayor and Council, with your permission, I will be uh, co-presenting with Diana Belthouse. I'm sure we can. Is, uh, the person to whom Renee referred to as someone who has been working on this. Uh, I'm sure we can accommodate that. I'm just going to need you, when you are speaking, to be closer to the microphones. But She, uh, she will come to the microphone. That's great. She's been working with this park since before most of us were alive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she was <loves> also. <laughs> so it's the same. You never change. Well, it's her. 
bien que je vais être en I'm going to turn you around and move you up to the microphone. Okay. Where's the microphone? Right there. Yeah. All right. Welcome, Diana Bellhouse. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Always a pleasure. Well, Mayor Little and members of council, I've been campaigning for parks in Delbrook for nearly 40 years. Sorry, pardon me, I can't read my own writing, for nearly 70 years. And I'm only dismayed to learn it's been removed from the budget for another time again to be decided to be kicked around again for five more years and probably defeated then. The money for the Delbrook Park was paid by the District of North Vancouver years ago when Delbert was first being established. The BC, I can't remember the writing. Oh, the Delbert Community Association was informed that the money covered the purchase price of land for a park in Delbert, four and a half acres to be developed. The playing fields to the west side of Delbert were developed and planned by landscape architects Justice and Webb and included the present carved park sign. It's all we got left of the park. There then followed a series of sales of the park lands, first to the school board for a high school, which burned down seven and a half years later. The remaining building and tennis courts were managed by the Rec Commission as well as the playing fields. Pieces of the park land were quietly sold for homes and the four story condo building at the corner of Delbrook and Queens was built despite the objections from the Delbrook Community Association and residents. A large tract of land on the east side of Delbrook was deemed unfit for housing and, and zoned for park development, but it was bought by a developer of large and expensive lots and homes and was a resounding success. A large tract, oh, and I should tell you that the money for that did not go into the parks acquisition fund. And it was Mayor, Mayor Marilyn ba Baker who told me that she was horrified it went into general revenue. A large tract of land on the east side of Delbrook was deemed unfit for a housing development, as I mentioned, and so on, and was bought by a developer of a large and expensive lots and houses. The planning department contacted me as chair of the DCA at that time on the future of land for a commercial daycare for Delbrook ch children. The committee agreed only for such well, anyway, I've got the main point in there. You can you can finish if you're <laughs> getting close, uh, Diana. Go ahead. Oh, well, thank you. Um, see, for a daycare for Delbrook children, we've we agreed only for such use for a year, but this promise was broken, and the lease extended recently thus tying up a valuable part of the park and it must be canceled. A community business, pardon me, a, a commercial visit business does not belong in a park. We should have refused and we wouldn't have had this problem now. And oh, I'm just looking to see what it says. Yeah, when the rec center, vacated the Delbrook Park lands. Big money was made by renting the old rec center and lands for the movie industry. And we all know how they pay, big bucks. This should have been credited to the park account for the future expenses of developing the Delbrook lands. And that's as far as I got. Okay. If you'd like, I could have these notes typed up and 
distributed to council? If you would like, uh, yes, but uh, I, I think we met and talked about the, the history of the fund that was set up to purchase the land, which was originally an offer with the city. They were gonna buy the, uh, uh, what is it called, Striker Ranch up at, uh, by the Color Your World on Lonsdale. And the money was acquired for that purpose. The city refused to sell the land to the district. And so the mayor at the time, Don Bell, took the money from that fund to go and acquire the school district property for a public purpose. So, um, uh, yeah. you know, I never had any way of finding that out. Okay. <clears throat> we had got a master's student from planning department faculty at UBC who did the history of our our area. And, well, I, I would and love that to sit down with you, Diana. And, find and, it. Yeah. Um, Where did you find that out? Don Bell told me, oh. um, and he was the mayor at the time when the decision was made. So, uh, so primary, primary source. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for your presentation today, uh, for Diana. And thanks for your assistance, Keith. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. What did you say? I'm going to pull you out and move you oh, up yeah, to your nice to see you. I'm sorry. I'm just going to move you up to your walker. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll drop the in person. Uh, the next speaker we have uh, is Michael Wartman, uh, followed by Eric Jensen. Uh, welcome. You have three minutes to address the council. Hello, Mayor and Council. Thank you for letting me speak. I am the architect at uh, 2672 Panorama Drive, and I was hoping to uh, just convey to you how much work from the consultant side has gone into this property uh, since I became involved. Um, I was engaged back in 2015 by the owner, uh, Mr. Ho, to help coordinate the efforts of a consultant team uh, following the events of fall of 2014, which were mentioned previously. Um, we were brought on board to lead a team of existing and new consultants to address the creek issues uh, and assess the existing building permit. Um, and it quickly became evident that a new creek channel would need to be constructed and a house uh, redesigned to accommodate that new channel. Um, and in order to meet the urgent need of the creek, we, uh, the project kind of was determined to be constructed in two phases. Uh, phase one was to work with, closely with the district to design and construct a new creek channel to safely convey uh, the creek through the site to Deep Cove. And then phase two was to construct the new house uh, and parking structure, which uh, we are still uh, hoping to complete. Um, and we've been waiting quite some time. The house itself is uh, 1,650 square feet or so, uh, spread out over three floors and a basement, meaning it occupies a relatively small footprint on the site and is set in roughly the same place as, as the original house in an effort to reduce the amount of excavation and site disturbance as much as possible. Uh, due to the steep slope, the house is set well down into the site with the top of the roof sitting below the level of the road above and is in fact smaller than both neighboring houses to either side. Uh, during the course of our engagement with the district on the New Creek Works, we were met with numerous new requirements and assessments that would change several times over the course of the project. And our team worked very diligently and closely with the district to meet these new requirements and adjust the design as needed to ensure that the requirements and thresholds for safety were met. Um, in addition to ourselves, our consulting team includes civil engineer, Creus Engineering, who prepared the Creek Hazard Report. Uh, they observed the construction of the new Creek Channel and are, uh, will continue to be involved in the project. We have Environmental QEP, Phoenix Environmental, who prepared the Riparian Area Reports, applied for Streamside uh, DPA, uh, including a SPIA variance and the Ministry Water Act approval for the construction of the Creek. We have a geomorphic risk assessment consultant uh, Cordilla and Geoscience, who undertook a risk assessment of the design in order to comply with new district regulations around life safety. Uh, we have a wildfire hazard report uh, prepared by Diamond Head that assessed the project uh, under the Fire Smart standards, um, uh, which resulted in some changes to design, including some non combustible cladding. Uh, interestingly enough, they also recommended the removal of all trees on site due to the fire risk, but of course, uh, we are committed to keeping those trees and so we fought against that particular requirement um, and the district agreed. Um, uh, our arborist, uh, Michelle from Radix Tree Consulting, who is here in case you have any specific questions about the trees, um, have been working very hard to preserve these large trees that were mentioned by uh, our neighbor Paul and uh, we've been working very closely with her and with the district arborist to do everything we can to preserve these trees, including modifying the design of the parking structure 
Um, and then finally, a structural engineer uh, was helping us design these structures. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael Wartman, for your comments. The next speaker I have is Eric Jensen, followed by Nicole Hebert. I don't see Mr. Jensen here in person. Is Mr. Jensen on the... Nope, this is about stormwater management. Yeah. Okay, I don't see him virtually either. Okay, uh, so the next speaker is Nicole Hebert. I'm a bit confused because my comments have to do with the 29th Street bike. The bike come on, come on up. Uh, just unfortunately, the people who are listening at home can't hear you unless you're sitting okay. in the microphone. Just my comments have to do with the bike lane on 29th Street. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. So I just had a few um, observations that by using the street, there's no access for the houses to get emergency vehicles. Direct access for emergency vehicles is impossible on both sides. Um, it's also noted that even if one side, it, it, they can't cross the street. So they need direct access to these houses for emergency vehicles. Um, that doesn't happen with those plastic poles. Those plastic poles need to be taken out and cement needs to be put in. $50,000 or not, that needs to be done. Secondly, the parking pockets, perhaps trying just with one as well as taking out those plastic barriers would be a great idea. Um, and I just had a question about the bike lanes that were put in. They were, they were brought to the, the people, the guys were going to try just one and then you put in two, right? And it didn't work. And the comments to ask the public to pay for that mistake is outrageous, by the way. And that's just my, that's what I want to say. Thank you very much. Okay, um, and so uh, we've completed the speakers. We probably still have a few more minutes. Ms. Jensen, if you had signed up and uh, I might be able to handle one more as well if there's another speaker wanting to address the council. Okay, welcome. Great, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, so my name is Carmen Jensen. I'm from the Hansworth PAC and uh, we're very excited to hear about the funding announced by Premier David Eby on Friday. Um, he announced $1 billion in funding, saying the new Growing Communities Fund will help local municipalities improve roads, build more arenas and water facilities, and improve recreation options for families. So we're very excited about that opportunity. Um, and I, I know um, you, as, your, as our elected leaders, um, You've all pledged that you would support a ATF for Hansworth, and uh, but the funding was a limitation, and now there is the funding. So we we're very excited that at the last council meeting on January 30th, um, you it sounded like you were going to consider adding it to the five-year capital plan, and now that this funding is available, um, specifically dedicated for improvement of recreation infrastructure. Um, we feel it's a fantastic opportunity for the councillors of the DMV to make good on their promise of an ATF and track for Hansworth School. Um, I'm also here with Stuart Ince from um, the soccer or the boys soccer club, and he said we have the support of both the boys and girls club in bidding for this funding. Um, so please don't waste the 250,000 that the school district's gonna use to pay for a grass field. If you can, this is a shovel ready project and we don't have to go and waste money and time um, tearing up a field in five years. Please, I, I hope you'll um, consider including this as one of the, um, the projects that, that will uh, benefit from this new funding option. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Don't see any other hands, so uh, we're going to carry on with the uh, uh, the rest of the agenda. Okay, on to item eight point one. This is development permit forty six seventeen for twenty six seventy two Panorama Drive. Um, comment from staff. I thought Yan Zhang was going to be joining us. Oh, virtually. Okay, there you go. Yeah, virtually. Welcome, Yan Zhang. Good evening, I'm Mayor and Council. Uh, just a really quick uh, staff intro to this item. 
this proposal is for a single family dwelling on the subject site, uh, 2672 Panorama Drive. The site is a steeply sloped site uh, with a creek running on the western uh, side of the property. The proposal requires a development permit and a development variance permit, which is uh, before you for approval tonight. To build a single family dwelling, there are uh, a few environmental DP development permit required, such as quick hazard, streamside protection, and wildfire ha hazard DPA. And in addition to facilitate this single family house on this constrained site, variances from the zoning bylaw are also required, and they are outlined in details in the report. It is um, quite germane to point out that the variances from the zoning bylaw are common for properties along Panorama, Panorama Drive, as there are quite a few challenging sites that don't fit into the standard provision of the zoning bylaw. There are some history on this site development, as uh, alluded to uh, by um, a previous speaker, as well as the applicant. There was a previous proposal, uh, DP and DVP, approved by council in 2012. And um, <clears throat> what happened was that during the construction, the uh, removal, removal of the previous building foundation caused damage to the eastern bank of the creek, and in combination of a significant rain event, it resulted in the scouring of the creek bed and in the deposit of a significant amount of debris downstream. The owners, uh, the applicant, completed reconstruction of the creek channel and the environmental remediation works under the guidance of qualified environmental consultants. During this time, their development permit expired and the site currently sits vacant. They have reapplied for a new DP with variances uh, presented tonight and the design of both structures, the main house as well as the parking structure have been amended to accommodate the newly constructed Creek Channel, as well as incorporating flood mitigation measures and facilitating the retention of shared and district owned trees. A covenant will be placed on title for the operation and maintenance of the creek channel to protect against damages for the future. Securities are being taken for the protection of the trees and a license agreement and covenant are required for the use of the parking structure and protection of district assets. So I will just leave it like that and um, staff are here to answer your questions. Project planner Taylor Jenks is, uh, is available as well. Uh, thank you very much. I'll be moving the staff recommendation. Is there a seconder for it? Seconded by Councillor Ma. Uh, just my comments on it. Uh, uh, this is obviously a tricky site, as is most of the 26 and 2700 block of Panorama, um, and um, a very complex um, uh, setback issues on the site. And, uh, um, you know, it definitely uh, the site has been um, worked on for a long period of time in order to be able to stabilize the space uh, and make it a viable lot. Um, and so, um, you know, I'll be supporting the staff recommendation, recommendation at this point, and uh, I wish them well. It's a very challenging site to work on as we've seen in the past, and uh, it's gonna be a lot of work, but uh, I think uh, it'll be very much in keeping with the neighboring properties in that area. Councillor Ma, your comments? Thank you, uh, Mayor Little. I also will be supporting the staff's recommendation. I actually drove by this, the site on the weekend just to get a, a sense of it myself. And as mentioned in the report, it is a very constrained site. Um, thank you for some of the history. I, I wasn't that familiar with what's happened uh, over the last uh, you know, eight years or so. Um, I think some of the uh, steps that have been taken over to, uh, over time has you know, addressed some of the concerns. And I, I make a note that, um, you know, the additional height would not affect the neighbors. And then finally, um, as the staff mentioned and uh, Mayor Little has mentioned that there's challenges on the site, but they're no different or the variances being asked for are no different than uh, found on, on neighboring sites. So. Uh, um, as I mentioned, I'm happy to support this staff recommendation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I don't, uh, oh, Councillor Muri, your comments? Uh, thank you, Mayor Little. Um, what size is the basement? 
Yan Zhang, do you have an answer for that? And I think we're looking for. I, I would uh, call up Taylor, Taylor Jenks. Uh, she would have all the detailed tech, okay. technical answers. Taylor's also joining us virtually. Taylor Jenks, can you hear me? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, the answer to Councilor Marie's question is the basement is approximately 654 square feet. 654 on top of the um, the square footage that's in the report for the uh, three floors. Oh, 1,653 square feet. Is that right? Um, the that's the total square footage. Yes, and some of it is up and then and then add the 650 square feet in the basement on top of that, right? No, that's the basement includes that. Oh, OK. I'm sorry, the total includes the basement value. I apologize. Sorry. The, the, total, the total gross square footage is 1,600 square feet? The total that Councilor Marie quoted at 1,600 square feet includes the basement as well as the three floors. Thank you. And is there a reason why um, in order to, um, so Mr. Perkins is talking about the two trees, the spruce and the cedar. Yes? Yes. Okay, it's hard to see you. We don't have oh. you on the, you're, you're a little far away from us. Um, so was there, was there a consideration to do tandem parking on the parking structure to provide a greater area away from the um, parking structure in order to uh, protect the root system of the, uh, the cedar tree? Um, through your worship, there were uh, multiple parking orientations that were considered um, including tandem. Um, there were some flood mitigation measures that needed to be included in the design, um, uh, which was about a two meter um, gap between the residents and the parking structure. Um, so in, in order to accommodate this flood mitigation measure, as well as um, maintain a distance from the parking structure to the district retaining wall to the north, um, the orientation that's in front of you was uh, determined to be the best, the best proposal. Do we have control over the um, the ten thousand dollar maximum retainer in regards to? So is that ten thousand for each tree, or is that ten thousand total? Um, through your worship, the way the development permit is written is ten thousand total. Um, I believe there is some discretion, but I might ask uh, Ms. Ye Ms. Zhang to comment further on that. Yan Zhang. Yes, Your Worship. So 10,000 uh, deposit for the tree retention. So we also have another 10,000 deposit for the landscape and um, uh, some site work um, that's anticipated on site. So that's for a $20,000 in total uh, deposit. So my question, though, pertains to those two trees. Um, they're significant stands. And uh, given that this property is on the edge of the creek, not all properties on Panorama have creeks running through their property line or, or adjacent to their property line. Um, so this is an unusual site and, and uh, I concur with Mr. Perkins observations. Um, you know, there has been significant issue with that lot um, over the years and collapse of the lot into the trees. Um, those two trees hold up that bank um, and uh, that side yard. Um, and if it, we had a problem when the structure was removed and the creek was negatively impacted. So losing those two trees um, to you know, improper excavation or any number of scenarios that could be realized um, is going to be a significant impact uh, to neighboring properties, hence the uh, Perkins grave concern about this, um, this structure. Um, so I, I have a problem with the fact that the 10,000 is just not adequate enough, in my opinion. Uh, I don't think that the uh, garage structure should have been uh, double wide. I think it should have been tandem in order to protect that, that west side. And uh, I have concerns. So can we vary that amount of money? Yeah, through your worship, I think, um, 
First and foremost, I think this work is being supervised by an arborist, and the the ultimate gain, ultimate aim is actually to protect those trees and not to take damage deposits. So I think uh, we do have the arborist report on, on uh, file, and staff have reviewed that report and uh, deem that the the protection measure uh, taking into the consideration of the creek uh, in uh, proximity is all taken into consideration. So. Um, and, and deem that deposit is adequate. And what we can commit to look into is that if, um, if you know, we, we can look at, uh, you know, uh, key inspections by city staff during, you know, milestone uh, dates of the construction, and then be in commit to be in constant communication with the neighbors, uh, if that's necessary, and to be to make sure that the construction is uh, happening in the, you know, in, in accordance with the professional reports. Yeah, I think my, Kelsey, my question, Kelsey my question actually was, do we have control on that amount of money for uh, the retainer on those two trees? Yes or no? Yes, we would have control over through worship. Yes, we would have control. Yeah. So no, I, what I think you're trying to get at is, can the council set an arbitrary fine, uh, um, security deposit on top yeah. to make sure that it is less likely that somebody would, with nefarious purposes, remove the tree out? Yeah, that's Mr. what Milburn, I thought I said. What are the caps and limits on uh, on our ability to assess a, an arbitrary security on a tree? <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship. Um, the Local Government Act. I need your microphone on for a second. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Your Worship, the Local Government Act and Community Charter provide for the ability for council to take securities as a condition of land use permits. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think um, in this case, uh, Council, what I'm hearing is looking at additional security necessary to guarantee the performance of the protection of the trees. Is that correct? I think that's the question from Councillor Miri. Is that accurate, Councillor Miri? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, and um, uh, working with the uh, with the applicant, I think the applicant would be uh, satisfied with providing additional securities um, uh, to to move this process forward. We want to be ensure that, of course, the trees are retained, and we have lots of measures in order to do that. Uh, security is just one of those uh, those measures. Um, there are also additional securities that are triggered by the building permit process as well that deal with landscape matters. So there's actually multi layers of protection, and I want to assure council that. Um, it, the complete intention, of course, is, is retention of those trees, as described by the applicant. Uh, council can establish a, a higher threshold, and I'm looking for the applicant uh, to express any concerns uh, with that. Okay. On page three, it, it wouldn't be at this point. I'm, I'm trying to get clarification on the legal ability to do this and how we would do it. Um, so, 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 Mr. Milburn, my question is then. Uh, so you say that the council does, through this process, have the ability to set additional securities on it. Right. Would that take place in an amendment? Does this have to be referred back to staff? How, how would that take place um, to the satisfaction of staff and the applicant? Uh, Your Worship, uh, staff can take direction from council at, at this stage. Um, however, the, it's, it's important to remember that security is not meant to be a punishment or a punitive measure. It's simply to guarantee the performance. Um, and the securities uh, as recommended by staff for $10,000, we believe that would be sufficient. If council feels an additional amount would be necessary in order to guarantee the performance of the retention of the trees, an additional amount could be set. Okay. So, so Councillor Murray, what I'm inclined to do at this point is matters been moved and seconded as it is. If it doesn't reach a uh, consensus on the motion that's on the floor, then we'll come back and we'll seek to amend the security on it and see if that, we'll test that and see if that gets the interest of the council as well. But I, I need to proceed, so I need to be able to go on to um, uh, to, to hear all the council talk. I, I understand. I just um, I think the Perkins have been through quite a lot on this property, and um, I think all of council is probably not aware of that history. It's too bad Mr. Perkins didn't have a longer ability to be able to explain. I wish we had had that letter photocopied so we could at least um, you know discuss this. I've spoken to him over the years about this property and. Uh, and um, the concern of what happened last time under permit, because it was under permit last time when the building was taken down and it collapsed into the creek. Can you clarify that, Yang Zan? Yeah, through your worship, I think it was um, a development permit and DVP was issued and construction started on the site and that's when the, um, 
the uh, with the foundation of the previous building that collapsed. Yeah, so this has been a precarious site. Um, it's a very challenging site. And those trees hold up that top of bank on the road. Um, and it's a, they're, because they're very narrow lots on Panorama Drive, there's not a lot of ability to be able to manipulate those areas. Um, so, you know, this is a precarious build. Um, and uh, I have concerns. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I have Councillor Hansen next. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I may be the odd uh, person out on this, but I, I, I simply, uh, in good conscience, and and I thank all the work that's been done by the staff, and I thank all the work that's been done uh, by the applicant to bring this forward. I'm aware of all the scientific studies and the opinions of experts uh, wearing, bearing upon this, but I, I, when I look at the site, I simply cannot and 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 review the history of the site. Uh, fact that it's a 35 degree uh, slope with a creek running virtually uh, through the middle of it, I, I cannot in good conscience uh, be part of any process that would put housing on that side. I, from my point of view, just way the, given the history, given the nature of the site, uh, the flood events that we can expect, uh, it was an unusual flood event I gather in 2014 that created the first impediment. There's gonna be more of those. Um, I, I simply do not want to be uh, affiliated with a vote that puts housing here, given what I consider to be uh, way too much potential for something to go wrong on, on a safety issue. So I will not be voting in favor. Okay. I see no further speakers on the matter. Oh, sorry. I'll okay. speak Council again. Mary, uh, thank speaker. you. So I think that um, it would have been helpful if we could have had more of a presentation in regards to this uh, property and this build um, and uh, a sort of a visual explanation as to why the variances were needed, um, especially with the history to this site. Um, you know, this is sort of being brought forward and I appreciate all the backup emails, uh, Ms. Jenks, that you've included in the in the package, um, sort of the discussion back and forth. Um, but I, I think really it needed more of a, of a illustration as to why these variances are required. Um, was it something that the um, develop or the builder or the property owner wanted in order to maximize as much of the space as possible? Um, or was it done because of the impact of the creek, the work that they did in the creek? And I recognize that. It's certainly, um, they've you know, certainly put in significant work to, uh, to uh, channel that creek. Um, but you know, again, there is that concern um, to both neighbors um, made comments on this. So I'm wondering if you could just um, take a few minutes to walk through the variances and what is required um, in order to build on this site versus what was wanted based on the architecture and the design. Ms. Jenks? And I go back to the parking structure. We didn't need to have side by side. It could have been tandem because we are giving a license to occupy. So it could have been a tandem in order to provide more of a buffer to that uh, tree on the west side. Um, yeah, so Your Worship, I'm happy to share some uh, images if you'd like on my screen uh, um, and I can walk thank through. You. Sorry, I'm just, just allow me one moment, sorry. can't see a slide yet. Yeah. Sorry, Your Worship, I'm just trying to uh, share my screen here. Ms. Jenks, are they the photos from the report or are these additional photos? Oh, there we go. Uh, there we go. Yes, your screen is shared. I can see it. Thank you, sorry about that. Um, this are the architectural drawings. Um, so I'm just going to start, these are the drawings that were included in the in the variance package, um, but I'm happy to, to walk through some of these. Um, so there are four variances that are regarding the parking structure itself. Um, these are for uh, paving in the front yard, the maximum parking structure in their front yard, uh, the minimum setback for straight in entry, 
and the maximum retaining wall height. Um, these four were all required in order to provide the bylaw, uh, bylaw required parking on site. Um, so regardless of what structure or what uh, single family dwelling was constructed, these four variances would be required. Um, the two. Ask yeah. Right, hang on, Council Mary. Could I just clarify that if it was tandem, would they still be required? It wouldn't have been as wide. Um, it's my understanding that they would still be required. Uh, the the setback would be still zero lot line. Um, the size of the parking structure that's on the the private property would be the same size. Um, and it, otherwise, if you push the, if it's an on of parking, sorry, you would be pushing upwards into the district property and there wouldn't be a uh, room for a turnaround area. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, the other setbacks are for uh, the side yard, the stairs encroaching into the side yard, which are on the eastern um, side of the house here. Um, the, the zoning bylaw allows the stairs to encroach into the side yard setback um, by, I believe it's three feet, sorry. And these ones uh, encroach further, so it's a, there's a, an additional variance. Sorry, I'm just... um, and then building maximum building coverage is uh, the sixth variance we're looking at. Um, which is just overall floor area. Um, and then which one are, the height variances are the remaining ones. So um, building and eave height, building height is measured from the average datum of the rear yard and the front yard. So there's a line that's drawn between the two datum points. Um, and the eave height is measured from the, the elevation, the finished elevation next to the exterior wall. Um, so as you can see in this image, the eave height is shown on the right and the building height is shown on the left and these are measured to the same point at the top. Um, so while the, the, yeah, sorry, I might ask uh, Ms. Zhang to step in if there's any other um, details that she can add. So I just want to go back and, and maybe if there's somebody else that can help answer this question, why do we need a 224 square foot variance um, if we were to have um, uh, accommodate a tandem parking, we give licenses to occupy into the district right of way. They're all the way down Panorama Drive. They're not uncommon. We have garages on uh, Panorama Drive. But I think the question was, uh, if it went to tandem, would it need the variance? And the answer back was it would still need the variance, obviously not to the degree of 224 square feet, but it would still need a variance into the space. I know, I guess my point though, is that the structure is large enough that it is moving into that, that area that is within that protected, protected zone for the tree. Mm -hmm. You can see the circle around the tree and the structure, um, it overlaps the structure. So if it was tandem, what is the distance between the tree uh, around the circumference of the tree for protection? Uh, Ms. Jenks, can you answer that or is that? Uh... Um, if council can allow me just a moment, I can check the arborist report for you. I think I've got Mr. Milburn here in the, in the council chamber. I'm gonna go to Mr. Milburn. Uh, thank you, Worship. Just wanted to note that preferably um, not best to redesign the site on the fly. Yeah. Um, and that if, if council feels that a rearrangement for the parking is, is necessary in order to achieve a certain objective, that direction to staff and a referral back to staff for bringing this back uh, would be appropriate, um, uh, especially if tandem parking affected use of district plans, that, that's a significant change to what's before council. Option as well, if we don't receive, reach consensus on the motion that's on the floor, then there is an option to return the matter back to staff and have a redesign that would contemplate a different uh, alignment. But Can I just move that now? No, we have a motion that's been moved and seconded on the floor and that would uh, uh, dramatically change the intent of the motion that's on the floor. So that's uh, ruled out of order. 
Okay. Uh, but what about the, um, well, I'm not going to, I don't know what other council members think of this, um, but I'd like to understand how we're going to apply an increased uh, retainer on the protection of those trees, yeah. because if uh, this motion does not fail and we can't refer it back to staff to deal with the issue of the retainer and um, clarify the issue of the carport or the garage, then- yep. If the council, sorry, we're way over time, councillor. If the if the council wants to change the policy around security and change it to a different number, we we probably shouldn't do that on a specific site. However, we do have the option to refer this matter back to staff and review uh, review that. But uh, it's not something that we should be negotiating in a council meeting. It's something that should be a part of the staff presentation as options. And so, um, at this time, we're over time for speaking. I'm gonna check back to the list. I, I don't see any other speakers on the list at this time. There is a motion on the floor that's been moved and seconded. It's the staff recommendation. I, I know, but if this- Councillor, you're out of order. We're, we've, I've already given you the, the options that can happen. If the council supports it as is with the security as is with the parking lot as is, there's nowhere to go. And that's up to a majority of council. If a majority of council has a different view and wants to send it back, then, then those other discussion points would be um, completely valid. It's on the floor for discussion as it is. So at this point, I see no further. Oh, Councillor Forbes, you wish to speak to the matter? Yep, go ahead. I just wanted a clarification because you just said that um, we shouldn't be negotiating this in public, and I agree with that. Um, not that we can't, have, I don't mean that we do it without public, but I mean maybe in the workshop sure. and not yep. at a regular council, council meeting. meeting. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you just said we shouldn't do it for an individual property. So I guess what clarification I'm looking for is when we take deposits, is that our max at 10,000? And are we not allowed to look at individual situations where we can vary that? Because the comment you just made has now confused me. Uh, no, it's just that, uh, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna defer to staff on it. How do you come up with the $10,000 site-wide security? Is it something that is just, that's the convention. Is it something you're specifically recommending for this property? Um, Yan Zeng. Yeah, Your Worship. I think the $10,000 is what we're recommending specifically. As you know, significant amount of uh, remediation work has already taken place on the site, already completed, and staff uh, did work with the Aberyst from uh, the applicant's Aberyst to come up with a security amount. Having said that, I think we have heard from um, council about maybe the need for additional deposit, a security deposit in this situation that can and certainly be explored as part of the building permit, which is uh, going to be part of the building permit stage. And so we could definitely increase that, um, uh, explore increasing that security, uh, looking at the, the risk involved in the trees coming down uh, in, in fine detail. So they will be taken care of at later stage. So to be clear, the, the security is not bound by the decision being made today. The security can be entered into as we go into the building permit stage. Is that correct? You're correct. Okay, thank you very much. So can I just clarify? We don't have a policy where we have a range or a max or a min. We just apply it, we do apply it on an individual basis. The staff uh, make a recommendation on yes. an individual yeah. basis, yeah. yes. Thank but you. If, if you wanted to make it the policy of the district in future, for them to be providing a range of options of securities, you could do that, but it's not our policy today. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I see no further speakers on the matter. I'm gonna call the question. All those in favor? Contrary-minded? Motion carries four to three. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. On to item 8.2, this is bylaws 8610-8611, development uh, procedures, bylaw and fees and charges, bylaw amendments for development variant uh, permit delegation. We've already had this matter come before council. Uh, are you gonna add additional comments on what was changed between the last time we had this discussion and now? Your Worship, I believe um, Ms. Zhang might be able to provide additional comment, but um, unless there's really any, any questions, uh, we'd be happy to go with council's uh, uh, direction. Um, there are uh, there is a, a report back um, on that clarifies a point that was raised um, previously. Um, and if there are any further questions, we'd be happy to answer those. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Zhang, do you have any additional comments? No, that's it. I think that's uh, 
We're ready to answer any questions, yeah. I'll be moving staff recommendation. Is there a second or second by Councillor Back? Um, just my comments on it. I raised the issue last time. I thought there was a conflict in the language that uh, could lead someone to believe that uh, uses could be varied uh, if it was read a certain way. And so uh, this was changed to make sure it was absolutely clear that staff do not have the authority to uh, summarily uh, vary use or density that matters still is the purview of the council through a rezoning process. Okay, uh, Councilor Back, any additional comments? No, Your Worship. Okay, anybody else wishing to comment on the matter? Councilor Mary? yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Milburn. I just wanna make sure that um, in regards to public notification that the applicant and or any neighbors that have any concerns about the variance, would there would be somewhere in the information that's sent to um, the uh, neighbors um, like the previous application, it was sent to the adjacent neighbors, um, that they know that they would still be able to have an avenue to counsel if they had a concern um, in regards to uh, the variance being, or any of the variances being supported by staff. So is... If, if I may, so if... Um, if the approving officer approves or, or denies the, uh, the development, the applicant has a way to appeal to the council. But if the appro approving officer approves it, the neighbors don't have a way to appeal to the council uh, to overrule the approving officer. They need that, to be able to understand. Is that your that. understanding of the, le of the, the regulation as it's printed? Uh, that's correct, Your Worship. And, and in fact, um, given that these are minor variances, the Local Government Act doesn't actually even require notice to neighbours. What we've done, however, in the bylaw itself is councils provide a direction uh, through policy as well to ensure that notification occurs. And so that we can have the benefit of all that, that feedback, that input to make sure that we can tailor the permit to respond to those concerns. Uh, but the way you've described the appeals process is correct. So just on that note, so if we have a public meeting, for instance, and we ask for comments from people in a public meeting, on the bottom of the comment sheet, it says, please provide your comments to planner such and such. It, those comments don't go to council. So the, the direct communication is from the public to a planning. And I just want to make sure that there is a way for the neighbors to understand that if they have a concern um, about what the approving officer is recommending, um, that they have an ability to know that they can go to council. Or the applicant can also go to council if they are not satisfied with the decision by the approving officer. That, uh, that is not the way this regulation is written. This regulation is to abrogate the council's decision making to the staff. No, I understand that. Yeah. To, to the staff in order so it doesn't come here to a council meeting. Correct. But that doesn't mean that the notification cannot somehow also include that, you know, if there was some sort of way to, uh, or concern that they wanted to appeal the decision that they could come to council to appeal. <clears throat> yeah, that's not the way it's written. And I but, know, but yeah. I'm asking that question, how could we include that? I, I, I I worry that it would completely reverse the whole intent of the process, which was to defer the decision making to staff. Yan Zhang, do you have a response? Yeah, Sri Your Worship. Um, I was just going to say that, as you know, that um, the public notification will occur as per our policy, uh, whether this is a um, delegated DVP or council approved DVP. And um, we are still in the early days of uh, understanding how that process will work and in terms of the actual wording on the notification. I think one of the things we have said is that staff will, um, we will uh, generally uh, only look at minor variances. Um, so in our notification process, as a result of notification, staff, the general manager of PPP could easily have decided that would be going to council. So we need to be carefully balancing that. And uh, generally, I just want to say that all the variances that staff will be considering will be minor and um, for, um, you know, for for a controversial um, item that, uh, you know, potentially could still go to council. 
Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate that. So the previous application, you wouldn't be sent, you wouldn't be approving as a minor variances, even though they, some of them were, were on the smaller side. I guess my point is, is that if you're going to notify the public, then you need to also ex expect the public to be able to comment on that notification. And uh, that is where we have a bit of a hole in this, uh, in this uh, um, new policy. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with delegating authority to staff for minor variances, but if you're going to tell people about something, you need to also expect that you're going to hear from them. And if, if staff disagrees with their perspective, then I want them to understand that they have, you know, uh, a way to come to council um, to share their concerns because not all variances and not all sites in the district are, um, so I so anyway, I, I, I get you and I, I, you I hear what you're, you're saying. The only problem is if council does, no longer has the authority to change the decision because we have by policy given that to the approving officer, then we want to be directing them to talk to the staff. We don't want them to be directing them to the council because the council can't actually do anything about it in that situation. Well, I think, I think Mr. Melbourne, the last time we discussed this did say that if there was some controversy that arose, the, the approving officer could indeed actually move it to council for decisions. So approving, it's not yes. like this is That's locked right. in, you know, and uh, written in stone. It can be forged to council if there's some up, up, upheaval in the neighborhood. Absolutely. Mr. Miller. Uh, thank you, Worship. And the, and the point is well taken. There are sort of layers of checks and balances built both within the bylaw in terms of criteria that limits the scope of the work, um, as well as the act, which is, is limited in terms of the scope. Additionally, there are guidelines, and as Councillor Miri has mentioned, uh, Your Worship, uh, there is the ability of the uh, the staff to refer the matter to Council where there are particular concerns. Uh, the final check and balance, of course, is um, uh, ultimately will be keeping Council abreast of the approvals uh, as we go along, providing a uh, an annual uh, report update, and then uh, the uh, bylaw could be fine-tuned if Council was finding that um, the decisions weren't in alignment with Council's expectations. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, I see no further speakers on the matter. And call question, all those in favor? Contrary minded, motion carries. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to 8.3. And this is obviously uh, the draft financial plan package that was received on table. We'll just uh, by way of a, a short explanation this, this has been uh, the way this has been delivered for a very long period of time. Uh, where uh, the council did not receive this document in advance of today, because the purpose of today is not to do a deep dive critique of the budget. The purpose is just to put it out in the public forum so that over the next three weeks, the public, the council can ask their questions of staff before the actual deliberations uh, take place starting March 6th, I believe is, uh, is the date. And so, uh, uh, so don't feel you have to immediately page through and find a burning question or something that's in the package. We all know you just received the package today and that the, and, 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 and the, the meeting to consider those questions is actually on March 6th. Mr. Danilo. Tomorrow morning, I thought. <laughs> and, oh, and, but to be clear about that, you can ask questions of staff at any point during this time and uh, they'll do their best to be able to answer and explain them. Uh, I mean, during the next three weeks. Oh. Yes, Mr. Danilo. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, good evening, Madam Council and members of the public attending and listening in tonight. After many months adjusting to the changing economy and more recently to Council's input on the draft plan, it's my pleasure to introduce the draft 2023 to 2027 budget tonight. It has been a challenging time for most and this budget is certainly no exception with demands to do more at a time when there's less resources and capacity and more uncertainty. Uh, we've been fortunate to have steady leadership and a strong planning framework to guide us through this time and have a fresh and talented financial planning team to, to pull this information together. I'd like to introduce you to Sasha Jones. On my right here, our section manager of financial planning. This is Sasha's first public meeting on the financial plan. I'm very happy to have her here with me tonight. <laughs> Sasha started in her new role in the middle of last year in what has become one of the most challenging planning cycles in a long while. She's man managed all the ups and downs with grace, all while being short staffed for much of the process. I keep saying to her, once we get through uh, this, things will return to normal. 
once we get through this recovery, it will be, it will be better. And the same can be said for this budget. Uh, welcome, Sasha. And I, I think you have, uh, you, you came from TransLink. So we have probably about a thousand questions for you on that work as well. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. The, uh, as, as the mayor said, the purpose of tonight's presentation is to introduce the budget and begin the public input process prior to council deliberations on March 13th. The budget is provided to council on the table and will be available to the public uh, tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. Tonight, we'll share the budget highlights and lay out next steps in the process. And the presentation will take approximately 10 minutes. The bu budget process started last summer with capital planning, and we have our engineering team uh, with us here tonight. Um, the capital planning was followed by an initial assessment of our position last fall, which showed a much higher property tax increase than the one being introduced today. Staff have been working with council on priorities and budget since December and held additional workshops in January to ensure council's initial directions were incorporated into the draft plan. Budget and strategic planning are running parallel uh, this year and it's our hope that staff will be provided direction to proceed with critical work on March 27th and uh, providing council with an opportunity to provide final input on the property tax increase on April 17th after its third input session on strategic planning. Public input on the budget is already being received, but will officially begin tomorrow with a summary provided to council ahead of its deliberations at the March 13th meeting. Okay. This slide uh, provides a few brief highlights on the community's profile. Um, it points to the district's rate of growth uh, over the last little while, which is, it is amongst the lowest in the region at 2.9%. And also points out income levels, which are amongst the highest in, in the region. This slide highlights a trend, which is um, occurring in most municipalities, which is showing our median age increasing since 2011. And along with that, likely uh, needs changing. Unemployment trends are also highlighted with the effects of COVID, which can be seen in 2021, and the district's unemployment rate shown in comparison to the 8.6 rate in the region in 2021. This challenging fiscal environment is highlighted on, on this slide, and uh, we do expect to continue to see cost premiums, especially for our projects on the North Shore. To mitigate these risks, we'll be setting aside additional funding to address increasing costs and will adapt to new information as critical work progresses and our financial outlook changes. We anticipate the tight fiscal environment to last through the remainder of the year and to continue to impact services, projects, and available resources. Although there, there is a, a good indications that the economy is improving, but we'll, we'll see what happens. The following slides lay out the prioritization process and highlights what's, highlight what's included in the draft budget. With limited resources and capacity and a premium on costs, only critical pro projects are recommended to proceed to construction in the near term. Although planning and engagement on delayed work continues and there will be opportunities for council to amend the plan through this process and again in the fall which fits nicely with council's strategic current planning process. Based on feedback received at the last budget workshop, the budget now includes a provision for the district share of, of a future partnership to construct an artificial turf field at Hansworth Secondary School. It also includes additional construction funding for active transportation in the outer years of, of the plan, which will, be, which will be funded through borrowing and construction funding for the new Delbrook Park which was mentioned earlier today in public input. The highlights on the next two slides can be found in the budget and brief section on page eight and nine of, of the workbook. Many of the highlights relate to capital. If you're interested in additional information on capital, there's a five-year capital detail section on page 56 of the workbook. And as mentioned, staff will be available throughout the public input process to answer any questions on the investments being made in the community. And again, our engineering team uh, here tonight 
uh, who we spent many long hours with collaborating on this book, and in particular on the capital section, uh, will be available to answer questions on the path capital plan throughout the process. On this slide, you'll see a total of 81.6 million invested in transportation capital, along with a refresh of the transportation master plans to inform future decisions on uh, transportation capital planning. You also see 85.4 million set aside for partnerships on housing, which would include the value of district lands allocated to those projects, along with a number of operating initiatives aimed at supporting the community's housing needs as, and a, a fair and balanced economy. And we'll hear more about the economy later tonight. This slide highlights investments in climate adaptation and mitigation, which include initiatives to engage the community to reduce their impacts, as well as upgrades to our utilities. And there's been a strong focus of late on reducing rainwater getting into our sanitary networks, which are creating environmental issues and are leading to cost increases for our ratepayers. So we'll be focusing on that over the next number of years. Also highlighted are significant investments in our parks, sport and recreation facilities, as well as investments in our libraries and completion of the new Maplewood Fire and Rescue Center to improve emergency response times and consolidate some of the existing facilities. Additional operating capacity is also provided for parks and fire services to meet uh, increasing demands, as well as provisions to increase our social service grants, which council has uh, been asking for, for a little while now. And so this budget responds to that. And it also supports uh, through that work, um, our non nonprofit organizations functioning in the, in the community. Finally, Critical investments in digital and technology will streamline our operations, address cybersecurity threats, enhance customer experiences, and support data-driven decision-making. Often when we, we try to put together a financial plan, uh, the, the hardest part is putting together the information to support the decisions. And so we see the uh, digital team as a key partner in bringing together better information for decision-making. Funding is also set aside to complete planning and design for delayed projects, again, in collaboration with the engineering team. And um, along with that, there, there's additional capacity to deliver projects in the future. Our financial planning framework lays out over, or sorry, looks out over a 10 year time horizon and is underpinned by a set of principles, strategies, and policies. The framework helps us measure funding gaps in our planning and helps to develop strategies to bring our services plans and finances into balance over the long term. This framework is now stabilizing the impacts from the current fiscal environment um, on our rate pairs. And if you're interested, there's more information on the long-term financial plan on page 20 of the, of the budget workbook. The financial plan, planning, excuse me, planning framework also sets aside funding for infrastructure and to manage our growth and, and risk. And many municipalities don't do this. So th these are best practices that uh, we began following a, a while ago. And uh, when these practices aren't followed, what often happens is budgets um, uh, uh, bounce from year to year and property taxes rise above infl inflation in the future. So there's much less stability and predictability uh, without uh, setting aside funding the way we've been doing for a little while. The funding that the district has set aside in the past is now being leveraged to support increased demand for services, including in our parks and transportation and smoothing the impacts on, on our rate payers. Um, council will have an opportunity to revisit the proposed 4.5% property tax increase in this draft plan in March and April. And there, again, there will be additional opportunities to amend the plan in the fall and beyond. Lastly, in, in terms of next steps, uh, the budget workbook will be posted on the website tomorrow morning and the same time that public input begins. And that input will remain open until March 6. Staff will be available to answer questions and will summarize the public's input for council's consideration uh, for their budget deliberations meeting on March 13th. Uh, 
Um, staff are also seeking approval in principle on the budget on March 27th so to allow us to get an early start on some of the critical work that needs to proceed. And then following council's third input on their strategic planning, council will have a final opportunity to revisit the proposed 4.5% property tax increase on April 17th. And um, that concludes my presentation and we're looking forward to supporting council and the public through the process. And um, thank you. Thank you. I'll be uh, moving receipt of the draft financial plan. Council Second. Mary seconding. Uh, just my own comments on it. Uh, looking forward to digging through the document and hearing the public's feedback on it and preparing for our own comments on March 13th. But thank you very much for presentation and all of the work that's gone into it from staff. We do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Mary. Uh, thank you, Mayor Little. I'm, yeah, March 13th is the first week of spring break. So it's unfortunate that we've scheduled the um, council deliberations on that day. Um, I wish we had paid a little bit closer attention to that two week period. Um, so that's unfortunate. I'm not sure if we can amend that. Um, there was an announcement on Friday in regards to a billion dollars for municipalities in the province. And I'm just wondering um, who made the first phone call to find out the uh, details of that billion dollars and how much do we get? Mr. Danilik? Or Mr. Stewart, Mr. Stewart, did you phone the premier and say, <laughs> just cut the check now? We have a big list. No, I didn't do that, Your Worship. Uh, but we have received correspondence, and, and quite frankly, we won't know until March as to how they're going to actually divvy that up. And so we don't know if we're going to get 500,000 or 14 million. And that's too big of a gap for me to comment on what's likely going to result. There's a number of formulas floating around. Okay. So once we know something, uh, I will let you know. And, and uh, I know one of the speakers talked about um, project that they wanted some of that money allocated to. There's a long list. <laughs> yeah. So we'll have some interesting discussions with council. But I think it's really important to, uh, to obviously in the situation that we're in and we're all in because of this economy and you know what's happened with COVID, et cetera, the carryover and just the capacity issues that we have on different projects. I know we've got capacity on, for Delbrook. We just need funding, I think is what I understand. Um, and then there's some issues with some of the other projects. Um, so I think it would behoove us to, you know, look at some of those possible scenarios in regards to that funding with whatever we know to determine what could um, be addressed um, during this budget cycle. Um, now, we also talked last week about some money that was in the um, provincial surplus um, prior to this big announcement on Friday. That's a separate amount of money that was previously applied for. Um, did we get any, did we, we talked about this last Monday when we were talking about 29th Street. Um, have we had any confirmation of that money? <clears throat> I think this is that money. Um, they're they're not applying the whole seven billion dollar surplus to these projects. They've only made one billion dollars available to these types of projects. So I understood that it's actually two amounts. Okay. Yeah, I talked to Susie Chant's office on uh, Friday. We're happy I to. So I just think that there was a previous amount that had been applied for because the MLAs had been given some money to be able to look at certain projects. And there was some projects in the city that Bowen Ma had applied for. And then Susie um, Chant had applied on behalf of ourselves for 29th Street. Um, so I think that money is being um, committed to. And then, um, then there was this extra announcement in regards to these, this billion dollars that's gonna go a lot further. Um, we'll okay. happily pursue any granting avenue uh, that we can uh, possibly pursue. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I see no further speakers on the matter, so I'm going to call. Oh, uh, Councillor Forbes. Yeah. Thank you, Worship. Um, sorry, just quick question. Um, seeing as how we just got this, I happen to notice that the community association briefing is this Wednesday. Do they? Did they knew that, know that prior? Sorry. The community associations briefing is on Wednesday, February the 15th. Did they know that prior? To That's tonight? correct. It's tomorrow, Anna, yeah. When, when? Might someone who might be interested in being involved with that, how, how do they get involved? Uh, so through worship, we, we've been in contact with the community associations and have offered follow-up meetings and um, we, 
engage with if them. If I want to get involved, how do I get yeah. involved? So, uh, I believe they they um, they post their information on on the website. On the website? It's, it's so, and it's available through your local community association. Yeah. Okay. And Thank in you. terms of the timing, they had they expressed some concerns with the budget being introduced tonight, and so we've offered additional support for them. Thank you. I, I'm sure they appreciate that, and I do too. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Pope. Thank you, Mayor Little. I'm really happy to see in this quick scan I've been able to do in this short time that Hansworth is indeed um, going to be getting a small amount of money over time, which hopefully will open the, the uh, gates to federal funding and other partnerships, at least if we're showing that we're, you know, we got some skin in the game, at least they might come through. Um, but I'm still concerned it's not enough. And I look forward to chatting with the Hansworth PAC about what they think about this. Um, and I'm still um, very uh, disappointed to see that the inter-river um, turf fields are, are not in this budget. And I actually took a quick scan at the, um, the old budget from 22 to 26. And it was interesting to me to see uh, that it was very clearly laid out there that new artificial turf fields um, were in the budget for Inter River Park, and they were actually given a dollar amount uh, in two places on page five and on page 31. Um, so I, my question is, why are they now out? Uh, we're getting to specifics here, but Mr. Stewart, do you have a quick response? A quick response is, uh, at the time that that plan was developed, I don't think that Argyle or Hansworth were in that plan. And so we were proceeding with a number of different uh, uh, projects, including into river. Into river, we had to uh, preload. And so we're now going through that process in terms of, of, of getting the, the, the load off the, off the site. But the challenge that we have is you, if you add up the, the gravel road, the, the gravel uh, turf uh, conversions, you add up Argyle, you throw in Answorth, you throw in a couple of uh, walk, washrooms, Griffin and Windsor, we're up around $44 million. So that's a pretty significant amount. And so we're gonna have to have spend some time with council to, to uh, land on a, a priority list because that is a, a significant amount. It's a very significant project and it, and it has huge meaning for tens of thousands of kids who live in North Van now and will in the future for their soccer games, for football, it's huge. I've received countless letters. Uh, I think it needs to be somehow made a priority and I would like to see this happen um, through this you know, windfall money that we're getting from the provincial government. I'm also disappointed to see that the spirit trail, um, which is critical to advancing our mobility transportation in North Van is not in here. And yet in the last few weeks, I've heard something about trying to find quick, quick wins, which is very bad phraseology, um, but that would sort of help move it forward. And I, can I get some clarity on that? Like what are the quick wins we're looking at for that? We have a quick response on that. Uh, I mean, the purpose of today is just to receive it so you can go over it. It's not to go in and do deep dive analysis of it at this point, but uh, do we have a, a, a response on the spot? Mr. Cohn? Yeah. Yeah, through the mayor. So in terms of what we refer to for the Spirit Trail, given the current financial environment, we're looking at how can we implement things quicker, recognizing that there's a longer term strategy for the full Spirit Trail to be delivered more longer term, which is many, many years in the making, but what could we deliver in a much shorter term, two, three, four years time frame? So we're gonna spend 2023 kind of going through that process to identify what those quick wins or whatever we call it is gonna be. How can you do that when there's no budget for it though? We do have, we have $200,000 set aside for 2023. Um, that's to progress the planning, consultation and design work for Spirit Trail. And is there any uh, consideration, and sorry to drill down on this, but it, it's really a question that um, I'm concerned about. Like, is, it, is, is part of it also looking at separate areas of it where it could be developed more quickly um, just to get, 
you know, to get the work moving on some level? Yes, yeah, so in, in total through the mayor, uh, there's in excess of 14 kilometres in the long-term strategy for what the Spirit Trail could look like. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really significant expense in excess of $30 million. And so we're trying to go drill down onto locations that could be easier to implement, quicker to implement, so that at least we can start getting better connections east of the highway. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I see no further speakers. So on receipt, I'll call the question. All those in favor, contrary minded, motion carries. Thank you very much. Looking forward to working with you over the next number of weeks to uh, uh, finalize preparations for our financial plan. Thank you very much. Okay, the next uh, item up for discussion is item 8.4. Uh, this is the 2023 Economic Development Initiatives. And uh, uh, Neonilla Lalova has been working with the district for quite a while now, but I think actually this is your first time speaking uh, at a public meeting for uh, with the district, so welcome. Thank you, Your Worship. You are correct. It's very exciting. I'm a little bit nervous, which is great. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, it wouldn't be so important. So thank you. Um, to Your Worship and uh, um, members of council, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today about a, uh, a very exciting, very important initiative for the district, something <clears throat> new as well. Of course, uh, I would like to present to you today the 2023 Economic Development Initiatives. Um, I will uh, quickly walk us through the agenda, very short, in keeping with our uh, time today. Um, I would like to present to you first the uh, policy framework under which economic development really sits um, in the district. Of course, uh, you're well familiar with this, so a lot of things that you already know about. Uh, but really the key here is to present um, our 2023 economic development plan and how, uh, how the district can uh, really kickstart um, its, its services for business in this difficult environment of recovery and so on. Um, uh, at the end, I welcome your questions and I look forward to hearing the discussion. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, the economic development uh, policy framework starts at the very top at the OCP 2030. Council decided and uh, agreed that uh, a diverse and resilient economy is really important for the district to meet its long-term planning objectives with the overarching goal to uh, uh, register 36,000 jobs um, by 2030. We're at about 31,000 as of the last census. Uh, the newest census has not come out yet, so things are on track, but with COVID and this new environment, um, there's, uh, there's a need for some action. Uh, the 2021 OCP review uh, looked at uh, kind of zeroing down on what are um, the initiatives we can under, undertake. Of course, the economy was one of four key focus areas, along with climate change, housing and transportation, and we're going to be looking for alignment between these focus areas. The priorities and supporting actions that resulted as part of the um, uh, 2021 OCP review action plan, there is a, um, quite a handful of them actually are in support uh, or uh, work to support business in the economy, uh, but really our next step now, and that was centered into the 2022-26 corporate plan discussion with the economic development strategy, how do we actually turn this into the key projects that we need to invest moving forward. The six initiatives that we propose to do this moving forward uh, are uh, economic development strategy. It's a fundamental piece that um, uh, takes care and uh, brings all the other five pieces together. Uh, there's some uh, background work that we'd like to do as part of the economic development strategy, but really uh, try to figure out what are the priorities, projects and programs to deliver um, what's in front of you. Uh, number two is business engagement and outreach. Uh, there's a need to enhance um, outreach into the business community and bringing that perspective into decision-making in the district. Uh, data and business information, um, an important um, aspect. I'll talk a little bit about that. Continuing our partnerships, strengthening our partnerships and building on our partnerships around economic development is a key piece. Our business development program, our fifth initiative, it's really the bread and butter of economic development is the one piece that's uh, very uh, trackable and measurable that um, we can show progress towards achieving broader goals. And last but not least, and very important, is improving our service um, portfolio or services to businesses. Quickly, I will walk you through the overarching plan for each one of these. Um, we want to start um, in 2023. We propose to develop the economic development strategy, <laughs> to finalize the economic development strategy, 
um, and really have the set of projects, programs, the service delivery model, and the resource, resources that are required to achieve our goals. We'll set out some uh, more operational level goals um, and as well as some of that data tracking indicators um, that will um, help us focus those programs and projects. Uh, we'll start with, we're supposed to start with a real asset analysis of our uh, district um, economic environment. And of course the key items there are, what are our employment lands, the supply factor in economic development and what are the growth industry sectors, businesses and so on of the future, the demand and how do we map, uh, map these moving forward. So this is really the economic development strategy that will have pieces of all these other five initiatives that I present to you today. Very important, our business engagement and outreach, um, there's various ways um, uh, or streams we can achieve this. One is bringing that business voice in district uh, policies and uh, whenever we, uh, we have, we consider policies that are impacting the business community in, in various stages or um, at, at, at various levels that we bring in that perspective into the discussion and have that as part of uh, the policy um, process. As part of the economic development strategy, we propose to have a business, a robust business engagement plan to, um, to ensure that what we're proposing and what we're enacting as a district uh, resonates with our industry. Um, and last but not least, um, targeted business consultation is, uh, is a goal and uh, an area we'd like to continue to invest. One great example recently was the outdoor patio program that you've heard, uh, where we targeted the businesses that would be impacted by, um, by the changes we're proposing as staff. So that was um, an example of what that could look like. In terms of data, I think my colleagues earlier mentioned that data is very important for making uh, informed decisions around policy. We wanna start tracking our business, um, our business tax base um, and having, having the data to inform what is happening with our business tax base. Um, there are some data points that are out there, but there's quite a, quite a good area for improvement there. Of course, having that regular data being collected uh, also reported on a regular basis will help us with making decisions around policy um, on, a, on a swift basis as opposed to waiting for that census cycle. Partnership, I mentioned there's various um, areas of partnership where we can invest. Uh, we have our district representation in business groups and, and uh, uh, committees out there. Our business services partnerships, I refer to the chamber and the tourism association who deliver on our behalf, um, uh, services in the business community. There's the broader business ecosystem and support network um, between um, senior levels of government, um, uh, uh, boards of trade, industry association. So we wanna be able to bring that network and make it available to our businesses. Um, and of course, the economic opportunity partnerships working with our First Nations on the economic development opportunity, that will be a target moving forward. Uh, as well as other stakeholders. Our fifth um, element that what I mentioned that business development program that's the bread and butter of economic development, we can really ground our work into seeing what kind of impact we make in the ground. Uh, retaining our existing businesses, supporting our startup and small businesses, uh, and of course working with our um, regional partners around business attraction because business attraction is a big piece that we, we cannot do alone. Uh, of course, this is very measurable around jobs, businesses, and dollars invested, and we'll, uh, we'll look to implement those kind of tracking measures in that program. I should mention, as an anecdote, I've been here only about six months or so. I think I have about good 24 referrals or so under business retention and expansion and attraction program. Um, so I, I see that need and demand to, um, to continue. And last but not least, I mentioned our service improvements. Um, there are our staff are bringing forward um, a permitting and licensing process review. I think this is in the work right now and will be coming uh, shortly to, um, to council, um, as well as uh, we wanna make sure that business is involved in that process and their needs as a customer of the district are addressed uh, with the solutions that we provide. Uh, that also uh, goes with our services online. So we'll, we'll be looking to working with our digital uh, strategy team uh, to make sure that our whatever process changes uh, we do, there's a technology solution that makes that accessible to businesses online as well. 
And this is really <laughs> the end of that whirlwind presentation, the six initiatives in front of you. I look forward to hearing your comments and to answer any questions. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I see Councillor Muri, you have a hand up. Uh, will you be moving receipts? I'll move. Uh, well, the recommendation and is that actually the proposed the 2023 yeah. economic development issues are are approved. So I'll be moving that recommendation. Councillor Ma, you're seconding the matter. Thank you, Councillor. Thank Mary, you, Mr. Lozen, for that presentation. I know you're. Uh, I, 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 I and I know that um, one to six is actually in a circle because one is not more important than six because I think number six is the most important, and um, because we need to improve. We need to become, uh, in my opinion, customer centric, customer service centric. We need to make sure that um, the problems that we've been experiencing over the years don't remain as problems. When we have problems, we figure out how do we fix those problems? How do we accommodate our residents and how do we accommodate our businesses in the District of North Vancouver to help them uh, live here and, and, you know, and work here? And too often, and I will use our zoning bylaw as a, 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 one of the biggest challenges, in my opinion, standing in the way of that initiative, is that if you don't, if you don't fit into the box of that zoning bylaw, you can't move forward. And we have dozens, if not hundreds of examples of those kinds of challenges where businesses are coming into the municipality saying, oh, I'd like to open up this kind of business. And it's like, sorry, you're not in that list of uses in our zoning bylaw, so you can't. And it's just not okay. I will give one quick example. When I was first elected in 1997, our existing planner at the time, Erwin Torrey, came forward to the council of the day and said, council, in Lower Pemberton, we have gun shops and dog kennels. Is that something that you are wanting to continue to support as uses in that area? And we said, absolutely not. And two weeks later, a, an amendment was brought forward and we removed that use as Mr. Stewart was the director of corporate services at the time and remembers. So it's those kinds of examples. We are constantly changing and evolving. We are all doing that personally, professionally, um, you know, the world is changing. Sometimes the world changes too much and it doesn't work for us, um, but we can't be static. Business is not static, especially in the environment that we're in now. Business is not static. It's constantly needing to reinvent itself. The restaurant industry right now is, is suffering. It is a very, very challenging time. Just getting an employee, we know what it's like, Mr. Stewart, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Walker, we know what it's like trying to get employees, trying to retain employees. It's the most challenging time, I think, in our history um, to get employees. No longer is working for the municipality uh, the job that, you know, a lot of people want. It's a, it's a very challenging time. So I look forward to this work um, and I look forward to regular updates from our economic development manager on this work, how it's going and how you can engage with council. I know I've certainly provided a number of um, references for Ms. Lalova to speak to different businesses that I've worked with over the years that have had challenges with the municipalities to offer an insight into what's going on, what their perspective is. And I think that's a, a really key part of this. So I encourage council, if you have people that you've talked to over the years, please pass their, their names and numbers on to Ms. Lalova. She'd be happy to speak to them and uh, get their perspective on this. And I would like to ask, um, uh, um, oh, and one more thing, I've got 44 seconds. Some policies that need to be, we need to be flexible too. There has to be a flexibility. We're too rigid, we live in a box. I want us to color outside the lines a little bit. We need to be creative and we need to make sure that our policies are not so contained that we can't look at uh, supporting a business because of a policy being you know, very rigid. Um, I would like to ask Mr. Milburn, um, what is the timeline on um, the work for the zoning bylaw? Have we started that work? What, what's the plan for that document? You're referring to what we're talking about in the workshop tonight? No, 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 the whole zoning bylaw needs okay. to be rewritten because right now it's about this thick and we need to get it down to something like that. And uh, so we d have talked about this over the years and uh, where, where are we with that? Mr. Milburn. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the need to update the zoning bylaw, which is a 1965 bylaw, was identified by council through the um, OCP uh, action planning process. Uh, staff have initiated internal work and review 
Um, and within the most recent budget before Council, I believe we're looking at uh, initiating that process uh, in the public and through uh, additional resources in 2024. Um, which is actually quite helpful because this year we have a real focus on the development application review process, which Mrs. Uh, Neonella Lova is uh, helping us uh, to work on. So that's a major initiative. And flowing out of that will be some specific recommendations that we anticipate in terms of improved uh, regulations in that zoning bylaw that we'll be working on in 2024. And uh, we anticipate that review would be approximately two years. Thank you. So since we're, I've got eight seconds. So um, since we're at the beginning of 2023, why is it going to take until 2024 to start this work when we've been talking about this for several years? I imagine it's extremely staff intensive. But well, it's, it's, the, it's, okay. So I've got five seconds now, but you we, have an additional two minutes speaking. Oh time. yeah. Right. Oh yeah. I forgot about that. Oh, I have m way more to say. Uh, <laughs> so on that point then, um, I think this is what we really have to talk about um, within the budget, is what are the priorities? And we started talking about that, Mr. Stewart, in December, and then in January, we had a really good meeting where council was able to just have some really good discussions about different things. And you know, the report that you brought forward in December talked about staff's priorities. And um, then in January, we started to talk about what was important to council. We need to have another, we, we need to have more workshops in that regard because we need to talk about what the priorities are. We need to, I think this is one of those priorities and it didn't even make the list. Um, and yet now it's gonna be pushed off into 2024 and it's gonna take two years to, to undertake. So we need to understand what those priorities are with staff that you know we could move to be able to look at some of these zoning bylaws. I'm telling you, I've talked to so many people who have said, you know, I, I talked to, you know, commercial realtors in the district that want to bring businesses in here um, where the businesses have been turned away because we don't have the uses within the zoning bylaw to accommodate them. Now, whether or not that's just the rigidity of the bylaw and we're not offering an ability to be flexible is uh, part of the problem. And if we can amend that quickly to be able to consider some of these uses or interpret some of these uses to be able to allow them to come into the municipality, I think we should give that credence because we've got a lot of um, spaces right now that are empty for lease. There's a lot of for leasing signs around. The market is changing um, and we need to be able to address those quickly and not take the amount of time that we take within the four walls here uh, to be able to, to respond to the business community. So um, I hope that we have, Mr. Stewart, that discussion so we can prioritize some of these things and give our, our perspective to, to staff in order to come to a a more middle ground on some of these priorities that have been put forward. Mr. Stewart. Your Worship, uh, the survey that I talked about after the last meeting is going out at the end of this week. Uh, it'll be something fairly easy for council not to only to look at the priorities that council's identified, but identify any others that you think are important. Uh, I hope to turn that around in a week and a half and then we'll set, set up another meeting, a follow-up meeting. But that, was the, that was the good cop response. The bad cop response is, it, you, you, can't, like you can't like prioritize like everything. We also have to be willing to say that that's not deliverable within a reasonable time and it's a lower priority than something else. And, and so I, I, that's all I'm, I'm just gonna say is that there has been a tendency so far to just keep saying, we're, we gotta do this, there's a priority for this, this should all be priority. At the end of the day, there's a limited bandwidth of capacity. And so we, you know, if, if staff come back and say that it's going to take a tremendous amount of staff hours to review the 1965 zoning bylaw, then you have to decide what else falls off the table in order to be able to do it. We my, my point is, Mayor, Mayor Little, what, I have four seconds. In the beginning of the 2018 council term, we talked about the zoning bylaw. Yeah, when Ms. Atva was hired, we talked about the zoning bylaw. Yep. And we're still now waiting another two years um, before, the, or a year before we even start the work that's gonna take two years. So two terms is a bit much. Councillor Ma. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Little. Local economy is critical to the quality of life on the North Shore. The plan as presented is ambitious, but I believe it's necessary. I'm glad to hear the engagement with First Nations. I'm gonna watch that with interest as that develops. Uh, and just quickly looking over the uh, notes, I, I didn't really see a lot mentioned about the, the larger industries, especially the ones on the waterfront. Um, is that, is there a plan for that as well? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what kind of industries? The, the, the larger industries, on, especially on the waterfront. Heavy industrial. Heavy industry, yeah. yeah. Through, uh, through the mayor's council, um, 
as part of that research and that may be feeding to the previous comments as well, we'll be definitely looking at uh, the uses that are on the waterfront versus future demand, uh, but definitely council has been forward in protecting industrial land and that will continue to be uh, part of our policy. Um, there are some interesting project opportunities on the waterfront in the Maplewood area that we would look at incorporating some of that research to the, into the economic development strategy. So that definitely will capture some of, uh, some of that industry on the front. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, just my own comments on the matter. Uh, thank you, Councilor Murray, for your comments. I, I think item number six is definitely something we can take some action on. It was interesting hearing the, uh, um, uh, and, and all of the items can be advanced, but I just wanted to say specifically that customer service component is something that I think we need to address. Uh, the, um, when I was at the Chamber's um, uh, update for Council, they, um, it's interesting, every time they survey their members for the last 10 years, it's been traffic and housing affordability and traffic and housing affordability. And then you started to hear staff retention, staff retention, traffic affordability all mixed in. And this year, one that had not been listed for um, in the previous years, all of a sudden was availability of um, uh, doctors, be able to get a family doctor. And um, I, I don't know whether it was something that just that that came up and rose to the top of the survey because there was some major media piece that week as everybody was filling out their paperwork. But um, I'm one who hasn't had a family doctor for 15 years, and uh, and I know that that is the common experience on the North Shore. And so when you don't have those kinds of critical pieces, which are outside of the control of the municipality, it's it's very challenging to attract. Uh, workers to our community. So it's it's sometimes beyond our ability to deliver, but still something we need to work with our partners to try to advance. But um, uh, so, no, I, I'm glad, uh, I, I think all of those initiatives are um, definitely areas that we need to be uh, advancing uh, in our relationship with businesses. And I think a lot of the um, questions can be answered by, by um, talking, creating forums, uh, roundtables, opportunities to uh, bring the businesses out and, and hear their concerns directly. Um, and so I look forward to working with you on that. Uh, Councillor Back, your comments? Sorry, Your Worship, I didn't mean to take the last word. I just wasn't quick enough uh, with my, bu my button there. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I'm very supportive of all of these initiatives, um, as I was through looking at uh, the local economy throughout our review of the OCP over the last term. Um, I think everything on this list is important, um, and I do want to change the, the reputation of the district uh, in terms of being a business-friendly community. I think it's it's really important that we do what, whatever we can to reach out to um, the local business community. I know the Chamber of Commerce certainly represents a large portion of the businesses on the in the district of North Vancouver, um, but they don't necessarily represent all of them. And so, um, you know, things like roundtables and reaching out to the different, and I'll definitely be sending you a list of, of businesses that I think uh, would be would be worthy of connecting with. But um, I think all of this is really important work. And one of the pieces that excites me is the business development program. I think, um, you know, so often people will have great ideas and, uh, you know, I've, I've definitely talked talk to a few over the years and I don't know where to send them if they want to, you know, take a look at, at opening up in the district. So to have somebody who can kind of help them through the process um, and help remove some of those barriers, I think will be really, really valuable. Um, I just wanted to comment on one thing about the, um, economic development strategy. Um, one of the things that we had with the OCP review was a series of lenses and there was a social equity lens. And I was just wondering if that will be applied to this work as well. Um, when we look at, you know, certainly great, I like Councillor Mott, really happy and interested to hear about the partnership with First Nations, but as well, could you talk about the, the social equity piece? Through your worship, um, to Councillor Beck, the goal of the economic development strategy will be to explore how it connects, how our economy connects to the other four, three priorities in the uh, or focus areas in the OCP, and that includes transportation, housing, um, and climate change. So, any solutions or programs that we bring forward will be evaluated with these perspectives in mind, knowing that we have challenges in all these different areas. So, um, the having the uh, the business solution power in those other areas will be explored as part of programming um, under the economic development strategy. That's great. Thank you. And what what's sort of the scope of the, what's the timeline for the economic development strategy? Is this a two year project? Is it uh, what are we looking at roughly? So your worship to Councillor Beck. Um, 
we were aiming for the end of this year, but we're a little bit delayed um, with um, uh, in the beginning with the budgeting process and, and all of that. So we're st we'll still hope to, do, um, to have a, a good working draft by the end of the year um, and we'll um, aim for adoption early next year at the latest. Great, that's excellent. And I, I too look, look forward to kind of more regular updates around uh, the important work that you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I see no further speakers on the matter. It's been moved and seconded. We'll call the question. All those in favor, contrary minded, motion carries. Thank you very much for the presentation today. Can we do it in four minutes? So where we're at, Council, uh, um, I, I would be inclined to say that we uh, table this to the 27th, February 27th meeting. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't just a receive for information. It's a little more material. And so um, I think uh, rather than coming back at the end of, uh, after the workshop, I'd rather refer it to the 27th meeting, if that's okay. okay. So I'm gonna move that it's tabled to the 27th meeting. Is there a second? No, it, but it's, it, they wanna do a presentation on it. Oh yeah. No, yeah. We wanna hear the presentation. So, so. You've enjoyed the last two hours. How long is the presentation? All right. If, what's the next step on that item? It just come. Sorry, can you? Is there a next the step on that item, or this is just simply this is, just, this is updating the policy? The yep. policies in force going forward. That's I'd right. rather have a, a more fulsome okay. discussion than if that's okay. Absolutely, no problem. Okay, so so I'm inclined to table the matter to the 20 February 27th meeting. Okay. That's okay. Is there a second on that? Second, second by Councillor Ma. All in favor, contrary minded, motion carries. Uh, thank you very much. Completes the business of the special meeting uh, this evening. Thank you very much to staff for preparing the reports. Thank you for the public for participating and thank you council for the deliberations you did. Everybody have a great evening. If you are here to join us for our workshop, we're going to be starting a workshop on um, single family housing regulations pertaining to secondary suites and uh, Airbnb and uh, other affordable housing initiatives. And it's gonna be starting in, Five minutes. Everybody can have a stretch. In the committee. No, in the committee.